Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we explore the far reaches of the globe in search of unique characters and stories to share. Reach beyond your front door as we uncover new perspectives, intriguing ideas, and lessons learned over time. Let's jump in. Let's get spicy, folks. Today, we take on the steamy and the superheated and those who enjoy it. Listen in as we pepper our fiery guest, Greg Foster, six-time Guinness World Record winner and founder of Inferno Farms Hot Sauce Company, with questions about just what it's like to take on the Carolina Reaper and win. Some of us can take the heat walker, and some of us just have to get out of the kitchen. Holy smokes, Harris, this episode is a spicy one. Well, you know I can take the heat walker. You know I love it. I feel another challenge on the horizon. Bring it on, walker. I love me some spice. Well, I absolutely love spicy food as well, but my stomach, not so much. Uh-oh. Spicy and I have had, what shall I say, a bit of a love-hate relationship. Okay. Yeah, despite this, though, Tabasco, chili oil, and Frank's Red Hot are permanent fixtures on our kitchen table. Oh, most definitely. Me too. My youngest actually makes the best chili oil I've ever had. I'll have to have him make you some. Are you serious? Yeah, it's so good. Oh my God, that is so great. Yeah. I have to admit, though, I'm a bit of a lightweight compared to some of my friends. I've actually had a couple of friends over the years who really love their spicy food. The spicier, the better. Right. There used to be a restaurant in downtown Toronto where you could order your dish at different spice levels. And I'm not just talking about, you know, mild, medium, or hot. When you ordered, you'd say, you know, I'll have a number 12, six chili level. Oh, cool. What's the name of the restaurant? I can't remember. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It was a long time ago. I don't even know if it's still around. It was back in the day when the world's biggest bookstore was around. It was still in business and it was located nearby. Oh, okay. But we all have those friends, Harris, don't we? Mm -hmm. who order their food top shelf spicy. We certainly do. And some of them are even family members. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, inevitably, going out for a bite to eat with them involves watching them sweat profusely through their entire meal. It does, though my husband starts the sweat even if there's just extra pepper on his meal. No way! Yeah, you think you're a lightweight? (laughs) Man, this guy can't handle anything. Hot peppers have a chemical called capsaicin, which binds to what are called TRPV1 receptors in the mouth and your gastrointestinal tract, which ultimately sends a message to our brain that is perceived as heat. Hmm. It tricks the body into thinking that its temperature is rising and therefore the body sweats in reaction to cool the body down. So our bodies think that we are on fire. Right. Okay. So that's kind of cool. Well, or uh, hot or whatever word you want to take it. I was going to say actually hot, not cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I get what you're saying. But sweating isn't the only reaction our body may experience while eating spicy food. We can also experience watery eyes, a runny nose, sneezing, coughing, and even flushed faces. Oh, I know those symptoms very well, Walker, but not necessarily related to the eating of spicy food. <laughs> I know, I do as well. I've certainly experienced the runny nose when eating spicy food, though. Mm-hmm. For those of our listeners who do experience a capsaicin triggered sweats i came across some tips to help them avoid the dinner time deluge oh that's perfect we're always looking for some hacks around here walker exactly exactly so the first thing you can do is start with smaller portions don't eat an entire platter of hot wings oh well that takes some willpower <laughs> though if you're really loving it well i didn't say it was going to be easy okay, okay? these okay. aren't necessarily easy hacks okay it's true though if you can't rein it in pace yourself and drink milk between bites milk Not my favorite Singha beer with my Thai green curry. Mm, Milk is better, Harris, if it's super hot. Okay. It's it's hydrating. And according to Dr. Mark Rood, as reported in an article for the Cleveland Clinic, drinking milk is helpful as it neutralizes the spice. And hydration becomes pretty important too, right? If you're sweating. Absolutely. There's actually a 2019 study that compared various beverages to see which were more helpful in minimizing the burning experience from eating spicy food. Okay, so what beverages did they put to the test? Uh, They included skim milk, whole milk, seltzer water, cherry Kool-Aid, non-alcoholic beer, cola, and water. Ooh, (laughs) Kool-Aid. I love Kool-Aid. Do you remember that Kool-Aid commercial when the big picture of yumminess would come like crashing through the wall? Oh, yeah. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking when you said that. Yeah. (laughs) What was his song? Was it? Oh. I want to say like, hey, 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 but that's not, that's Fat Albert. That's that not is Kool-Aid. Fat Albert. <laughs> no. What's Kool-Aid? Oh my gosh. You know, I'm going to remember it after we're done recording 
na, na, na. No, that's something else. From no, the I just remember the bricks flying everywhere yeah. as he busted through and the wall. We're going to have to Google it. <laughs> In fact, it was one of the best beverages to combat spiciness along with milk of all kinds. The casein protein found in milk provides the best cooling effect, though. Well, now I have a reason to buy Cool Heat again, Walker. I'm so excited. You do. Did you know that you can build up the tolerance to capsaicin? Really? Through repeated short exposure, just like with most other things, it seems that when you eat it, the amount needed to experience a similar effect will be increased the next time you ingest it. Hmm. It certainly isn't an overnight transformation, but it happens over time. Cool, like a little hair of the dog. Exactly. Best cure ever. Maybe we should tell our listeners what hair of the dog is, Walker, because maybe it's a Canadian thing. I don't know. I don't know either. Okay. It, well, it's usually an expression you, you use sort of after a night of drinking, right. right? Yeah, when you're feeling really, really garbagey, hungover. So best I, thing ever, I think, hair of the dog is a Caesar. A Caesar. Which is like a American Bloody Mary, but with Clamato juice. And lots of spice. Lots of Tabasco, <laughs> I don't baby. Know, do you have the spice, though, when you have a hair of the dog? Oh, yeah. You do? Oh, I make it spicy. Oh, see, I don't know if I could handle oh, it. Oh, so the, spicy. The tomato juice or the Clamato would be really good, though, yeah. because it's so hydrating. You've yeah. got, you know, your, your vitamins in yeah, there. Yeah, it's nutritious. So I did a little research on how the body processes capsaicin walker. The capsaicin experience doesn't begin and end in our mouths, as you might well know. Do I ever. Jaina Metalonis, a dietitian for University Hospitals, explained that the burning feeling in our mouth that we experience dissipates after about 20 minutes as the capsaicin molecules stop binding to the pain receptors, but it doesn't stop there. Well, based on my past personal experience, I can concur that it doesn't. Oh. You might experience a burning in the chest as the capsaicin binds to the receptors in the esophagus and the phrenic nerve connected with the diaphragm might cause hiccups. Increased mucus in the stomach and increased metabolic rate may lead to cramping and pain in the tummy, and you might have diarrhea from an increased rate of digestion in the intestines. So it's pretty unpleasant. Nausea, vomiting, pooping, all kinds of lovely business. Now what's not to love? Right. But thankfully, my experience has been limited to just maybe a little sweating, a little burning in the mouth. Maybe I need to up my spicy quotient. I think you're spicy enough, Harris. Oh, thanks, Walker. <laughs> so can capsaicin-containing food cause long-term damage to our bodies, or are they just sort of temporary effects? Well, there's differing opinions on this topic. Again, Jaina Metalonis noted that high school students in California were hospitalized with breathing problems after taking part in the One Chip Challenge. Oh. They ate one chip made from the Carolina Reaper and scorpion chili peppers. Do, have you heard about that challenge, Walker? I have heard about the challenge. I didn't know the details of the challenge. Yeah. I've just sort of heard the term floating it's about. A spicy chip. Yeah. Now I want to now I want to eat it. I'm kicking myself I didn't bring one of those today for you. I know. It could have been a challenge, Jay eh, Walker. Although it's... I'm actually not so keen on the side effects. I hear you. Metalonis also noted that people have been known to experience thunderclap headache, which sounds horrendous, from constricted blood vessels in the brain and even sometimes esophageal rupture, okay? I don't know what that is, but it sounds terrible. Generally, though, the esophageal rupture is thought to be caused by vomiting after eating extremely hot peppers. Well, that sounds very nasty. Very nasty. However, it's not all bad. In an article online posted by You Chicago Medicine, it appears that there is a lot of misconception about spicy food being bad for you. Hmm. Spicy food is actually good for you, Walker. Okay. Mm -hmm. A 2015 study compared people who ate spicy food six to seven times a week versus once a week. Those who ate spicy food almost every day showed a 14% relative risk reduction in total mortality. Hmm. And despite what people may believe, spicy food does not cause ulcers. Dr. Edwin McDonald IV says that multiple studies indicate that capsaicin inhibits acid production in the stomach and has been considered as sort of a medical reliever for preventing ulcer development in those that take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Wow. Yeah. That is so surprising. I know. Clearly something to discuss with your doctor if you do suffer from ulcers. Right. Medical professionals agree upon the fact that you should be careful, however, if you suffer from conditions like IBD, celiac disease, IBS, or dyspepsia. If hot, spicy foods cause you pain, don't eat it. Common sense. Right? Use your common sense. Use your common sense, people. Don't do 
what hurts you. So if you don't handle your spice well, keep your distance from the Carolina Reaper. It's an insanely hot chili pepper developed by Ed Curry in South Carolina, the hottest in the world, apparently. The Carolina Reaper was supposedly created by crossing a Pakistani naga with a red habanero from the West Indies and tested between 1.4 million to 2.2 million SHU, or Scoville heat units. A Scoville heat unit? Yeah, that's the scale that they use to rate and classify hot peppers, and it's named after scientist Wilbur Scoville. Ah, huh. So how would the heat of a Carolina Reaper compare to another type of pepper that I might have tried before? Well, you should check out the site Chili Pepper Madness. There's all kinds of info there on chilies and even some recipes too. But to put it in context, it says that jalapeno peppers average about 5,000 SHU. Okay. You eat those, right, Walker? Yes. Yeah, I love those. But the Carolina Reaper is 440 times hotter than a jalapeno. Okay. They are also more than twice as hot as ghost peppers, which they say range from 855,000 to just over a million SHU. Okay. So this really puts it all in perspective for me now. Yeah. And just as you had some hacks for helping us minimize the potential side effects of spicy foods, I've got a hack for you too. Oh, you do, do you? I do. If you ever find yourself in a Carolina Reaper eating competition, <laughs> the best, which you might, uh, yeah, you never know. know. <laughs> okay. Life okay. skills. Never say never. Never say never. The best thing to do is to get those bad boys out of your system as fast as you can. Like throw up? Like throw up. Shahina Wasim, also known as the UK Chili Queen, is a competitive chili eater and she claims that if you keep them in, you will experience what she calls the worst night of your life. In discussion with author Lee Cowart, she revealed that she has experienced cap cramps caused by capsaicin in 11 of the 71 competitions she's taken part in. Ugh, this is not for me. Me either. I don't like cramping up. That's not something I <laughs> opt in for. She actually describes the experience as follows. You can't get up. You're literally on the floor like palms up. You're begging and you get cold sweats, hot sweats, everything. And you're literally begging for death. It's that painful. It's like being stabbed multiple times and it's the worst feeling. I bet throwing up can't be bliss either. Oh my gosh. <laughs> After you've just eaten that crazy stuff and now you're... I know. And you've got to relive it again. No. And throwing up is horrible on a good day. Exactly. Right? Yeah. In her words, she says, it burns coming back up as well. But then you think, well, I'd much rather have that than like 12 hours of being on the floor, hungered up, crying and screaming in agony. Okay, when I said I like spicy food, I know now that I'm a bit out of my league here, Harris. Oh, yes. There will be no Carolina Reaper competitions, I think, in my future. But luckily, we have an expert in the field with us today, Walker. We're excited to introduce the hot and spicy Greg Foster, six-time Guinness World Record holder and the igniter of palates worldwide as the founder of the Inferno Farms Hot Sauce Company. Welcome to At Home and Abroad, Greg. Why, thank you for having me. We are so excited to chit chat with you today. So we have to start with your six Guinness World Records for eating hot peppers. Can you tell us about these? Everybody wants to know what set you on this path to being one of the world's spiciest guys. I've always been a spicy lover. I've always been that guy that wanted something hotter ever since I was a kid with my older brother. You know, we would go into Mexican restaurants and ask for the, the salsa that wasn't out on the table that would light us on fire, go into Thai restaurants and telling them to cook it like they'd cook for their families at home and uh, always getting strange looks of amazement when we would eat the food and not die. Uh, you know, my, my mother always had a garden and she had peppers in the garden, be it jalapenos or habaneros or serranos. So there was always some sort of heat in in the family as it were and right. um you know i was always looking to just enjoy the heat and you know it was it was just kind of like another ingredient in in a dish it wasn't you know something shocking or all, altogether surprising it was just kind of part of the 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 common denominator within our food you found this love of hot things pretty early on in in life then did you greg oh yeah yeah my brother and i would you know play games of uh war for you know or poker for for 
dabs of Tabasco sauce, shots of Tabasco. Rather oh my than... gosh, you guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah, we totally were. Yeah, um, I was more the tequila kind of gal, not the Tabasco kind of gal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were a little young for the tequila back in the day when our, right, when okay. our, our true experience with beginning to get spicy we were we were still in our early early preteen years when we were messing around with each other okay and was that going on in your friend group too or was it limited to your you your know family? a little bit in my friend group uh but not so much people have always been kind of you know amazed that i had this kind of knack or this desire for spiciness even now it's like people they they don't eat the same food that i eat they won't they don't trust me anymore when i say here try this you know it's, <laughs> it's like, not spicy <laughs> right to me it's not spicy what are you talking about right. it's melting my face off right right you know? and uh you know, so it's always a challenge to to find people who are brave enough and and have enough tolerance to yeah. to enjoy the same food or the same level of food that I'm eating. Yeah, well, I would imagine that eating peppers like this is pretty rough on the body. So, do you need a specific mindset when you're sitting down to scarf down those uh, Carolina Reaper chilies, or how do you prepare for these these kinds of competitions? Well, the competitions, you know, it's it's just like any extraordinary competition that you go through. You've got to have kind of mindset that, you know, it's mind over matter really is, is you kind of got to get out of your mind, you know, what it's telling you you can do and then just kind of pushing your body to what you're physically capable of doing. And, and, and really a lot of these, these, especially the speed ones are more mechanical repetition and, and you know, efficiency versus heat tolerance. Because by the time the time is up, you haven't really kicked into full-blown spicy awareness yet. Right. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it's hot and everything, but it, it's a lot of practice of, of mental, as it were, displacement, kind of getting out of your, out of your, mind and out of that awareness and just in into the motion and into the into the rhythm you know and I can it's funny because I can usually tell within the first one or two peppers if I'm on pace or if I've got the rhythm to have any chance at you know at breaking a record just because I know I've done it so many times that the rhythm is established within that first bite and swallow that or that second bite and swallow because if you don't have it at the beginning it's really really hard in a very short time to recover right and do you have like a personal cutoff point where you realize as you're in a competition going through the the motions that okay I can't I can't do this anymore or do you ever hit that point well I'll never give up I mean I always right. try you know I mean the the ones that are timed for like a minute you know, it's like, I'm not going to just stop and, and be like, oh, well, I, I know I'm not going to do it. So why bother? It's like right. people are there to, to see a show. And, you know, even my bad day is going to be 10 times better than most people's best days. So. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Better than mine, Greg. I'll tell you that. Because, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I mean, most people get up on the stage and they'll eat one or two peppers and, and they'll they'll bow out, you know, mm -hmm. within a minute. Or I'll, I'll be in 10, 11, 12, up to 20 peppers and still not break a record. But who's going to, in their right mind, eat 20, 25 reapers in one minute? I, only you. Only you, Greg. And that's <laughs> why we're talking to you today. So how do you recover, though? Like after you've swallowed all this excessive heat, how do you what do you do to recover? Or do you have to do anything? There is a whole kind of preparation I go through uh, leading up to a contest. And, and very generally, it's just making sure that I don't have an empty stomach, that right. I'm not dehydrated. You know, I might spend a minute or two just kind of quickly meditating just to kind of to get away from the, that sensation of pain, right? right. I've, I've, I've gotten to that point where I can turn that switch pretty quickly. When I first started doing competitive chili eating, it took me, you know, a good hour or two to feel like I was in the right mind space. Now I can pretty much get up on stage, take a couple breaths, close my eyes, and I'm ready to go. Wow, um, that's impressive. But but that's with a lot of practice and a lot mm -hmm. of competitions and and you know for for the newbie or the people who are new at competitive eating you really got to find a way to center yourself and 
and prepare yourself and also just remind yourself that that the pain that you feel is a it's going to go away fairly quickly b it's going to hurt and c it's not hurting you physically it's just really a trick of the mind it, it, it's all in the mind so if you can kind of prepare yourself in that way the the actual experience of that pain is is so much less impactful like you know shock a lot of people go into shock a lot of people race themselves to the hospital and it's like well in half an hour you're going to be fine as long as you the the trick is really to to get everything out of your system as quickly as possible so as soon as i get off stage i'm chugging as much milk and water as i possibly can to fill up my stomach and build pressure so i can exit everything out of my stomach within very mm. quick time um, mm. but of course once you do that the heat starts all over again because reignites the palate. Dairy is kind of for the the calming effect. The way to really break down the capsaicin and, and the oil is to what I usually do is I'll do like a um, mouthwash gargling with with citric acid, like just lime juice. Uh, really? And what that does is, yeah, the the citric acid breaks down and denatures the capsaicin and the oils, so the reaction will stop. Whereas the milk, the, the case and protein will kind of coat your mouth for a little bit, block the receptors. But as soon as all that milk is out of your mouth, it just comes back with a vengeance, you know? Okay. So it's good to kind of relieve it temporarily, but it's not a permanent fix. You're still going to have the ups and the downs. What most people think is, oh, I'll just drink some water. Well, water is the worst thing to do because it just spreads the oil around your mouth more and it actually Ooh. makes it more intense, which, oh. which people... You know, I see people suffering and they're drinking water. I'm just like, oh, honey, you have the no wrong idea. thing to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be on the ground in the fetal position and they're not forcing themselves to throw up. And, and really that's the trick to, to get over that amount of capsaicin and pepper fire that's in your belly. You got to throw it up to, to, to try and pass that through your system if you've never eaten a fresh reaper or multiples of one reaper, you're in for a good 36 to 48 hours of agonizing pain. They, they, I've had people tell me that it's almost as, as bad as going into labor. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I'm not going down that route because I've done that already a few times, Greg. So <laughs> thanks for the warning. Okay. This is not my future career. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Greg, what was the most memorable competition you've ever personally participated in? And okay, we're we're waiting for the good, bad, and ugly here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best one was when I actually won my first world record. It was in in uh, Tempe, Arizona. Uh, it was the one and only Arizona Hot Sauce Festival. It's like 110 degrees out. It was sunny. It was only my second attempt at this record. And my first one, I, I came in at like 62 grams and that was in Portland. So I, I kind of knew what I was getting into, but I, I didn't have any inkling that I would be able to break the record. And, you know, it was God awful hot, blazing sun. And uh, I just went up there and, and, you know, the stars aligned, you can see the video on YouTube and, and it, it, it just became very mechanical. And I didn't even really think that I was going to break the record, but I did by one gram, which, you know, is a miracle in and of itself. But it was also memorable because I hadn't perfected my post contest strategy yet. So <laughs> I was really suffering really bad trying to throw up without you know I wasn't drinking water I wasn't drinking milk it was I you know I was out of my mind and I was sweating so bad and my body started cramping up like my hands were cramping up as I was trying to hold on to the trash can it was really? just yeah it was awful I was sweating bullets and just oh it was so awful so it was like Kind of the best and kind of the worst all in one. The pain and the ecstasy of the. Of the oh yeah, it was it definitely a, a yin and yang, as it were. <laughs> so, Greg, your company's mission is to broaden people's taste with, in your words, exciting and inspirational flavors. How does Inferno Farms Hot Sauce aim to do this? You know, with thirty years of culinary experience and and working in the hospitality industry, there's 
always been sort of a passion of about flavor with me. You know, I, I studied wine, uh, liquor, beer, food, food pairings, you know, the nuance of flavor. And that was something that I really wanted to bring to my company was was all that experience, all that understanding versus just kind of throwing the kitchen sink into a pot and blending it together and calling it a hot sauce. Right. I'm very intentional with how a lot of those things work together, all the different ingredients. Um, and then more importantly, how all of those play with food, right? So sweet, savory, bitter, you know, tart, all of those things that you want to bring to bear how do I encapsulate them within within a bottle and, and and really bring, like I said, bring that to food that enhances food? Because anybody can throw peppers and vinegar and salt into a bottle and call it a hot sauce. It, it really takes a culinarian to know the difference between different ingredients and how well they work together or contrast. And I can't be the judge. I think my sauces are really good, but I think it's up to my customers and the people out there to tell me you know, if I'm doing a good job or not, you know, I make my sauces honestly for me, but also with an understanding that I'm not the only one eating them. So I have to sometimes temper the heat levels. I have to temper some of the flavors, you know, some of the passion ingredients I want to make sauces out of. I have to consider that as far as a, as far as a business, you know, is it going to sell or is it too niche of an ingredient? Um, you know, so there's not only the 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 passion of creating flavors and different sauces, but there's also weighing that with the with the business sense of is this going to be something worthwhile? Is this going to be pe something people buy, or is it just because I you know have this ego and I want to see these ingredients in in a bottle of mine? Right. Well, it sounds a lot more thoughtful and not just in a bottle. Yeah, well, as I say, I'm not just some guy who had a habanero bush in my backyard and all my buddies told me it was great, so I should start a company. I was very methodical in, in my approach to starting this business. I got to learn the industry from a really good friend of mine, Ed Curry, founder of Puckerbutt Pepper Company. He really taught me a lot about the business, a lot about selling hot sauce and you know, I got to see the the insight from the industry standpoint before ever really thinking about starting my own business. And then, of course, you know, there's product research. I made dozens and dozens and dozens of different sauces and had hundreds and hundreds of people try each flavor. And it wasn't and it wasn't pretty sometimes. I had a lot of people tell me that it was awful. And, you know, rather than get upset and feel violated by a negative comment, I go, okay, well, great. Yeah. Thank you for your opinion. Can you share with me why you thought it was unpleasant? Yeah. You know, it, sometimes you have to hear the hard truths to make to, it better, to, to make something better. Because at the end of the day, that's what a business is about is selling product. So if I think it's great and my friends think it's great, okay, that's awesome. They're, they're biased. You know, what is the regular schmo walking into a grocery store? think about the sauce when he buys it. Is he going to buy it again? Not after the one bottle purchase. I'm after capturing a palate, capturing a customer. They're so in love with the sauce that they rave about it. Tell all their friends. I mean, that's how you grow a successful yeah. business. Developing a culinary relationship. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, I like that culinary relationship. I'm there we go. <laughs> that can help. On a personal note, Greg, we're dying to find out what's your all-time favorite spiciest dish. Oh goodness. <laughs> um, I did a commercial spot um for LG Mobile a few years back up in LA. We did it at this Thai restaurant, and for the life of me, it's escaping me right now. But this the chef who rest his soul is no longer with us but this guy uh this thai chef was kind of famous in the sort of hollywood area for doing this really spicy challenge dish that was this thai curry and in the like 20 years that he had this challenge going he had only 12 people finish the plate oh. and he had a book of of all the people who had ever attempted it he had a book where people had signed it and he had a special couple of pages in the back for the people who had finished it now being in hollywood of course you thumb through these pages and you see celebrities and and you know magnets and all of these huge names that anybody would recognize um so we come to film this whole commercial bit for lg mobile and the the whole kind of premise was i was teaching a novice spicy eater 
how to eat the spiciest dish. Of course, she took like one taste and was done. <laughs> I ended up eating my entire plate. And then I was like, well, shoot, there's a whole nother plate of food right there. It's really tasty. I ended up eating both plates and the chef came out and he's like, you ate both of those? I'm like, yeah, it's really, really good. <laughs> but man, it was so spicy. I, I was driving home from LA back to uh back to orange county and about halfway through you know that instance where you're like driving and all of a sudden you're like i need to get off the road right now and find a bathroom yeah i had one of those experiences and... <laughs> i know that well <laughs> <laughs> but that was super super tasty oh my goodness well thank you so much for chatting with us today greg you you've inspired me personally to amp up the spice in my life <laughs> If you'd like to learn more about Greg Foster, follow him on Facebook and Instagram at, at Inferno Farms or find out more about his amazing hot sauces at www.infernofarmshotsauce.com. Thanks so much, Greg. Thank you for having me. Thank it's you. been a lot of fun. Eating Carolina Reapers competitively clearly is not for the faint of heart. Oh, I would wholeheartedly agree with this. Mm -hmm. I think being able to tolerate hot food signals a sign of toughness, right? Somehow, like resilience or you can power through. In his New York Times article, Daniel Victor discussed just this, saying a resistance to spiciness can produce shame as well as taunts from others who see their love of spiciness as an act of courage or a mark of more refined tastes. Wow, interesting. Yeah, the whole issue of spice tolerance or lack thereof can come up quite regularly when people go out to eat. Absolutely. There's usually some sort of compromise, like when ordering wings in a group. Do we order half mild, half atomic, or agree somewhere in the middle with medium? Yeah, exactly. Or ordering jalapenos on the side, not on the nachos. It's only fair, right? I love jalapenos, like bring them on. Nachos too, come to think about it. But I wonder what's behind our tolerance or lack of it, Walker. Well, according to an article written by McGill University's Office for Science and Society, the answer is both physical and psychological. I thought it was only in the taste buds. No, all roads seem to lead back to the capsaicin, which triggers our TRPV1 receptors. Apparently, it is the level of sensitivity as well as the number of these receptors that determines our tolerance. So what's the psychological component then? Well, everyone experiences the burn, but more tolerant people take pleasure in it. Okay, so that explains explains why some of us keep going back to the spicy dark side over and over again, even if it doesn't agree with us, right, Walker? It would explain why I'm a glutton for punishment, mm -hmm. for sure. There is a great book on the subject of why some people love to experience pain entitled Hurt So Good, The Science and Culture of Pain on Purpose by Lee Coward. That sounds like a topic in and of itself. <laughs> sounds good, Harris. Add it to the schedule. Okay. Now, this is cool, though. Did you know that loving spicy foods can tell us something about our personalities? Like those with spicy personalities love <laughs> spicy food? Sort of. Chris Malore says in his article that if you like spicy food, you likely lead a life which is spicy. Ooh, a spicy life. <laughs> I love a spicy life. Listen to this too. Apparently those who eat spicy food compared with those who like milder foods are 76% more likely to try new things and 62% consider themselves attractive. Oh. And, and even more than that, 66% are content with their lives. Wow. These findings come from research conducted by one poll on behalf of Frank's Red Hot. Oh, well, okay. On behalf of Frank's Red Hot, maybe we have to take it with a little grain of salt or something but I love Frank's Red Hot that's my go-to go-to have you tried their version with lime it's so good no oh and I will so have to good. try it yeah I love the quote from Kevin Vetter, the executive chef for Frank's Red Hot. He says, it makes perfect sense that those who take the heat head on are ready to take on anything and everything else Heat fans go big on both flavor and adventure, and they're always chasing the spice of life. Oh, I love it. Good advertising. And I actually think he's on to something there. 
It doesn't stop there, Harris. Cambridge University Press published the findings of three studies just this January, which examined the potential relationship between spicy food and risk-taking. Oh, this should be interesting. Yeah, this the first study revealed that people in general were more inclined to attribute a higher level of risk-seeking to individuals who enjoy spicy food. Hmm. Those who stated they preferred spicy food scored higher in risk-taking. Okay. The second study examined whether people who like spicy food have more risk-seeking tendencies. And? Yep, it seems they do. Okay. And the third study discovered that people momentarily experiencing spicy foods increased their risk taking in the Iowa gambling task, which is as it sounds. Wow. So spice lovers seem to have a tendency to experience spicy risk taking tendencies and actions. Seems so. Hmm. But, oh, but oh. it gets even more interesting. Okay. Another study conducted by the University of Grenoble Alps in France reported that there is a positive correlation between behavioral preference for spicy food among men and testosterone in the saliva. Well, this kind of goes back to that perception of toughness, right? Kind of. Yeah. A, a 2015 Penn State University study, though, actually looked at how gender and personalities might influence our taste. Oh. The study revealed that men tended to say they liked spicy food more than women, but the research indicated that women liked the hot taste of capsaicin more than men in a taste test. Oh, that's so interesting. Are you saying that? The research indicates that women like spicy food for the spice taste and men like the notion of being the type of person who eats spicy food. That is very interesting. Uh, I know. There seems to be a cultural association between strength and being manly and eating spicy food that has resulted in what is referred to as a learn social reward for men. Hmm. Somehow I'm not surprised, though it does seem kind of silly, doesn't it? It does. So beyond gender and personality, why is it that the cuisine of hot countries tends to have spicier food, while colder countries in general tend to be more bland? We need the heat in Canada, Harris. I know. Why don't we have a spicier local cuisine? I don't know. It boggles the mind. Yeah, that and why countries with the biggest bugs never seem to have screens on their windows. (laughs) They just open up the shutters on, you know, the window and it's an invitation for every little critter to come on in. It freaks me out. Like, why I'm not that? sure how like, that relates to the topic, Walker. I think those you're... are the two things I've always wondered about. <laughs> you are such an insectophobe. We're going to have to work on this, oh, man. Maybe God. we need to have that sort of short-term exposure. Oh, yeah, for oh, sure. Let's try it out. That's something to figure out another day. Some cultures have a reputation for having spicier food than others, don't they, though? Yeah, they do. I know it used to be thought that spice offered an antibacterial benefit in hot countries where there were foodborne diseases or like more of a prevalence of foodborne diseases. But in recent years, this theory has been challenged. Today, it still seems to be a bit of a mystery. I think we should road trip to find the spiciest foods in the world. Walker, what do you think? I think we need a bigger production budget. Yeah. (laughs) So where would we start? Uh, Well, we could start in Thailand. They got some spicy food. Sri Lanka, Mexico, Malaysia, India, Trinidad and Tobago, and Jamaica are all among the top spicy destinations. Jamaican cuisine often features scotch bonnet peppers, which rank pretty high on the Scoville scale. But India and Trinidad are certainly two of the top producers of the hottest foods. Okay, not surprising. Yeah, not surprising. But maybe it's all in the interpretation because residents of countries with truly spicy food don't consider it spicy. They just consider it to be food. Yeah. Right? Mary John Ludy, a professor and chair of the Department of Public and Allied Health at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, states that a child raised in Mexico or India or raised in the United States by parents who cook spicy food is more likely to seek out spiciness as an adult than those raised on blander diets. Basically like the old adage, children learn what they live. Like Greg Foster said, he and his brother grew up with spice. It was just a part of their childhood. Absolutely. My childhood meals were pretty bland, Walker. I don't know about you, but despite that, I've always had a pretty good tolerance and I like to explore my spice boundaries. I've never had a meal though that I had to sign a waiver before though have a, you a spicy waiver no. yeah that would be a bit of a red flag I no? would think so yeah well you know people you tell them you warn them and you say this is gonna be spicy <laughs> I know people it's gonna burn your face off <laughs> but they just don't grasp how serious you are and I guess restaurants don't want to be sued because there are side effects that you get so Make way for the waiver. So what kind of food requires the signing of a waiver? I'm concerned now. I know. Well, 
The Fiery Death with Hate Sausage from Mikey's Late Night Slice in Columbus, Ohio is definitely one of them. Wow, that's quite a name. I'm mm-hmm. not sure Fiery Death sounds too appealing to <laughs> me. Not today, anyway. No, Fiery Death is not all that appealing to me either. One reviewer from the Columbus Underground reported that one bite into the pizza slice itself is molten death. Ah, just what we're all looking for today in a meal. Yeah, molten death. The waivers are not only for the savory foods, though. There's also a ghost pepper ice cream on offer at the ice cream store in Delaware. Not only do you need to sign a waiver, you also have to be 18 just to order it. Whoa, I guess the milk in that case isn't doing the job that it's supposed to do. I know, I guess not. The waiver apparently states the following warning. Okay. Okay, hold on to your hat, Walker. (laughs) Anyone with heart ailments, vascular problems, respiratory problems, back problems, vision problems, high blood pressure, sinus conditions, digestive problems, circulation problems, immune problems, neurological problems, or problems with authority should not (laughs) taste this product. Oh my gosh. Isn't that all of us? I know. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, it does check a lot of boxes for me. And get this, the waiver comes with an additional warning. Which is... It should be noted that what is painful going in may also be painful during exit. Ah! Yeah, listen, Walker, before we end this episode, I wanted to skip across the pond just for a moment to Burger Urge in Australia, which doesn't just stop at a waiver. No. They require customers who order their double-decker Death Wish burger to wear protective gear. Come on! Yep. Gloves and goggles. One of the managers of the restaurant is said to have said, we have to take special precautions when we prep it. That alone tells me someone's in for a treat. The gift that just keeps on giving. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your host, Harrison Walker. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate it if you would rate and review our show. It helps us grow and expand our reach. Subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. You can also say hi to us on Instagram at at Harrison Walker. We would love to hear from you.